The human body is something that has been around since the beginning of man's existence, obviously. And yet, there still seems to be a lot that we don't really know about it. The progress of medicine has always been rather slow, and every medical discovery was a miracle in itself. The world was changed with the development of vaccines, the discovery of insulin, and the first successful human organ transplant. Well, I'm here today to tell you that we are on the verge of one of these life-changing events. If you look to my left, you'll see a strange shape growing inside a woman's forearm. If you haven't guessed what that is already, that is in fact a human ear growing underneath the surface of her skin. A woman by the name of Sherry Walter unfortunately lost her entire left ear to uh, cancer a few years ago. And so, rather than get a prosthetic ear as past patients had done, she came up with, or the doctors at Johns Hopkins University Hospital came up with a rather unique solution. They thought, hey, why don't we just grow her a new ear? And so here you can actually see the ear that was implanted in her forearm. Using cartilage taken from Sherry Walter's own rib cage, they implanted it in her forearm and allowed the stem cells in her body to produce the blood vessels and skin covering this scaffold. And then here you can actually see the ear once it's been implanted and it's later to be shaped to look more like an actual ear. Now at this point you may be wondering, why isn't this bigger news? Why isn't the world freaking out about this? Well, it's simply because while this is incredible, uh, this ear lacks the necessary components such as the eardrum or the cochlea necessary for hearing. She can't actually hear from this ear. And so despite this, it is certainly a step in the right direction. By now I'm sure you'd like to know what exactly stem cells are. What am I rambling on about? Well, by definition, stem cells are cells that uh, within the body that never die and can continuously regenerate tissue throughout a lifetime. When you started off as a zygote, a, a fertilized egg, which is just a sperm, fusion of a sperm and an egg, you were but one cell. And that cell had to have the capacity to divide and create all of you. So naturally, it had to be a stem cell. By eight days, you become this mass of cells called a mass of stem cells called a blastocyst, and a few weeks later, you start to develop into a human embryo. And throughout these periods, of course, you have to have plenty of stem cells to develop into all the major organ systems of your body. And as time goes on, these stem cells become more and more specific to certain types of tissue. And uh, shortly after you're born, the vast majority of your stem cells switch off, never to divide again. Only a few stem cells, such as your skin, hair, and blood stem cells remain activated because these parts of your body are always being replaced. Scientists are not exactly sure why so many of our stem cells are switched off. If you get, if you get a scrape and lose some skin cells, it'll be replaced over time. But say you damage your brain, the stem cells in your brain will not activate to fix your brain. It'll simply produce scar tissue to try to limit the damage. So stem cells are trying to, uh, scientists are trying to figure out how can we reactivate stem cells and harness their potential? On a side note, there is actually a curious species of flatworm known as planaria, whose entire body is made up of nothing but stem cells. If you cut it directly down the middle, its head will grow a new tail and its tail will grow a new head. No one has ever seen one of these uh, worms die, making it biologically immortal, or die naturally. So it's biologically immortal. There's also another recent event involving stem cells. Uh, two scientists, a, one named John Gurdon, a 79-year-old British biologist, and another named Shinya Yamanaka, a 50-year-old Japanese stem cell researcher, recently jointly won the Nobel Prize for Medicine just last year. And so uh, their discoveries were over four, four decades apart, and it was this incredible life-changing event that led them to win the Nobel Prize. Let's start with John Gurdon. So working at Oxford in 1962, he removed the nucleus from the cell of a frog and replaced it with the nucleus taken from the intestinal cell of a tadpole, a baby frog. He did this a few thousand times, and in a few cases, the tadpole's DNA actually reprogrammed the cell, and that cell developed into an exact clone of the tadpole. And this is incredible, because this was actually the first time something was successfully cloned. Over 
30 years before the more famous cloning of Dolly the sheep. Shinya Yamanaka's work stems from this. So uh, working at Kyoto University in 2006, he took regular human skin cells and without going into too much detail, added extra copies of four genes. And so what, what did this did to the cell is that the skin cell reverted back to an embryonic state. He took cells that were done dividing and turned them back into stem cells. He literally reversed the human body. And so with such an amazing discovery, we can see there is a lot of potential within stem cells, but it's our responsibility to foresee all of the potential consequences of this, both good and bad. So we have to imagine uh, the consequences for medicine, society, and for our place as human beings. Let's start off with medicine. So if you look to my left, you'll see all of the major organ systems of the body. Stem cells, uh, with their capacity to regenerate, could regenerate any of these different organ systems. And the stem cells have already been used to cure certain diseases such as leukemia, which is bone marrow cancer, and uh, sickle cell disease. And then it could also be used to cure diseases that were thought to be incurable for a long time, such as arthritis or any diseases involving nerve degeneration, such as Alzheimer's. Uh, another interesting thing that it could cure is type 1 diabetes. Now, for those of you who don't know, unlike type 2, which actually comes from malnutrition and lack of exercise, type 1 involves the body's own white blood cells attacking these groups of cells called islets in the pancreas for some unknown reason. The issue with this is that these islets are responsible for creating something called insulin, which allows the nutrients from the food you eat to be absorbed into your body's cells. Now, stem cells possess the capacity to regenerate these islet cells and allow type 1 diabetics to no longer depend on insulin shots or insulin pumps. Uh, I myself was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at the age of four and a half, and it was actually uh, the potential within stem cells to cure type 1 diabetes that really got me interested in them. And seeing all these amazing discoveries with stem cells, I do have a lot of hope for this medicine. We also have to consider the consequences of society. At the moment, there are over 100,000 people on the uh, organ transplant list alone in the US and many more in need of organs in the world. With stem cells, uh, organs could be not only be made more available because they could be produced on a regular basis, but they could be made more affordable. Perhaps one day you can log on to eBay and buy yourself a heart. We also have to consider the negative consequences of this. Now, at this point, we know so very little about where we're gonna go with stem cells and what we can really do with them. So we have to consider even the most outrageous possibilities. So imagine 50, 100 years from now, there is a war raging in some part of the world, and a soldier, unfortunately, loses both of their legs. Now, under normal circumstances, that soldier would be done, out of the war. But if, in 100 years from now, we've mastered stem cells to the point that we can regenerate limbs within weeks, that soldier could be placed back into the war. And this would cause two problems. First of all, this would prolong the war, but more importantly, it would decrease the value of a human life. And that's why we have to be so careful with this. We also have to consider the possibility of overpopulation. Throughout history, the average human life expectancy has increased in accordance with advances in medicine. In medieval Europe, the average life expectancy might have been around 40 years. And today, with better medicine and cleaner environments, it hovers above 70. And so, that's what, and so potentially, with human beings living longer, uh, the population increases more rapidly than it would have before. I mean, think back to the planaria that is biologically immortal because of its stem cells. And so we do have to consider uh, such a possibility as overpopulation and be wary of it. Lastly, we have to consider what this means for our place as human beings. I was telling a friend of mine about uh, stem cells and the discoveries and all of the possibilities. And she's fairly religious, so while she was amazed by it, she said that it also sounded like human beings were trying to play God. And it really dawned on me at that moment how incredible what we were doing was with stem cells, how, how, really, how we were manipulating the human body to our will almost. And so, you know, are we playing God? I can't really answer that, but it's just something to think about. 
I, I don't know where we'll go with stem cells, but I do have a lot of hope for what we can potentially do with them. And I encourage you all to watch the news regarding stem cells and pay attention to where we're going with this, because this is, in fact, the future of medicine. So now, regarding stem cells, I'll leave you with this final thought. When it comes to stem cells, where do we draw the line? Thank you.